So when I was about five years old, I have very vivid memories of uh, riding along in the car with my father as we every evening would drive our nanny, housekeeper, and childcare person all the way back to the other side of town where she lived. And I remember very clearly asking later uh, on the way home, why is it that Teeny, who was my caretaker, had to live in such an awful place? And my, and because there were dirt roads and people lived in shacks and there were no street lights. And uh, I remember my father saying, it's not right, it's just the way things are and maybe they will change someday. And it was 12, I guess 12 years later that um, I found myself sitting at the Woolworths counter in Little Rock uh, with a couple of black folks refusing to order until they were served. And then a few years later when I was in graduate school, um, people in my generation managed to uh, bring the war in Vietnam to an end. And then it wasn't too many years after that that we were able to oust a corrupted president from office. And then we got involved in the environmental crisis that all of us saw coming, even way back in the 70s and 60s. Um, unfortunately, my generation dropped the ball. And I think it's our, our responsibility to, to fix that as well. Um, yesterday, when Mary Beth and I were cleaning up and getting things ready for today, uh, she asked me, well, uh, I've been retired for five years. And she said, what do you, mo what do you miss most uh, from your working career? And I said, uh, not having a captive audience every Friday night and Saturday morning to hold forth to. <laughs> and when I try to do it at home, my wife leaves the room. <laughs> And I thought, what a wonderful opportunity I have today. <laughs> so I want to give you a, a short sermon. I, my primary commitment in being here uh, is not reclaiming our corporate controlled and dominated political system. Uh, it's uh, not, it, it, it is primarily because of my worries about the effects of climate change. It's not just about the laws and the decisions that have transformed those corporations and given them so much power. Uh, imagine giving human rights to inanimate objects. Something deep within me tells me that this is idolatry. Yet there is not even a whimper from the religious right or the fundamentalists. Jewish, Christian, or otherwise. I'm primarily engaged in this effort because of what's going on with the environment. I think the world is headed toward a perfect storm of existential crisis. We are facing catastrophic climate change, severe environmental degradation, devastating scarcities of food and water and our leaders wear blinders, and that prevents them and us from becoming aware of the ecological meltdown that's going to proceed out of climate change. So my ultimate concern is to address that critical issue for our species and for all life on Earth. Uh, it's clearly apparent that the issue is not going to be solved as long as corporations rule the world. Everything else, campaign finance reform, uh, enforcing EPA rules, uh, universal health care, can't be addressed as long as corporations hold our elected officials hostage with cash. So 
If we look, and we don't have to look very deeply, uh, they're really taking us for absolutely everything. And we have got to insist that they change that path by telling them uh, where we are not going to go. I almost wore my backbone t-shirt this morning that says on the front, when the people lead, the leaders follow. That's what's so encouraging about that super citizen pack that uh, Lawrence Lessig started or announced yesterday, and in one day they raised $300,000 to put people we want into Congress. We are going to inherit a sad situation if we don't address the climate issue rather quickly. Uh, I'm not so sure that there's going to be time to fix it in our lifetime or in my children's lifetime or in my grandchildren's lifetime. Um, it's so multifaceted. It's not just those corporations that are making mi billions and billions uh, by unsustainably extracting fossil fuels and passing along the external cost to everybody else. Part of the sickness is also our addiction to a consumption-driven, unsustainable lifestyle that has to be addressed, but which none of our leaders are able to even mention. The Hebrew prophets of old, role models and spiritual predecessors of the religious tradition that I was ordained in, champions of social justice, protesters against a corrupt, unjust, political system, teach those who venerate them that we have got to involve ourselves in working for major changes that will lead to a society where there's less oppression, less injustice, less violence, less hunger, less poverty, less inequality. To me, it is just patently clear that the opposition to social security, to affordable medical care, uh, to workers' compensation, uh, and all of those benefits cannot be reconciled with the teachings of Isaiah, of Jeremiah, of Amos, and Micah, with their concern for the poor, the widow, the orphan, and the homeless, and the hungry. And not to mention their concerns about working for a more peaceful and just world. My religious tradition teaches that there's a God who demands that we take care of the poor and the powerless. And that God even makes that a communal responsibility. These are responsibilities that the United States Constitution plainly states to be functions of government to promote the general welfare of the community. It's not, it, it is, it is totally beyond my ken how anybody can consider himself or herself a good Jew or a good Christian or a good spiritual anything uh, while believing that government has got no role in implementing social goals that would decrease poverty, unemployment, homelessness, and hunger, while at the same time working to increase the common good. My religious values of compassion and justice and sustainability, concern for the poor, are actually inconsistent with any group that concerns itself mainly with helping the wealthy become even wealthier at the expense of the poor and the middle class. Support for politicians who want to cut social services while keeping tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans is totally inconsistent with the religious teachings of caring for the most vulnerable members of our society. I base what I'm saying today about our political climate not on, you might think, partisan uh, political leanings, but out of a sense of religious obligation to speak truth to power, to confront evil and bigotry uh, and greed in the tradition of the prophets of ancient Israel. It's those prophets, those prophets of the eighth century 
who will not allow me to forget that imperative of justice. What we need in our time is for people to take seriously the prophetic tradition and demand that the right thing be done. The work of economic and social justice is spiritual work. And I often underscore that particular point by sharing biblical words from Amos and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Micah. But when I close today, I'd like to do so with the words something, or at least paraphrase something Christopher Hedges wrote about some more modern prophetic voices. This is what he wrote. The suffragist Susan B. Anthony announced that resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. Thoreau said that we should cultivate a respect not for the law, but for what is right. We heard the one about Frederick Douglass Douglas from Marx, so I'll skip that one. Uh, the 19th century populist Mary Elizabeth Lease could have repeated these, her same words this very day. She said, Wall Street owns the country. It's no longer a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, but a government by Wall Street, of Wall Street, by Wall Street, for Wall Street. The great common people, she ended, of this country are slaves and monopoly is the master. And General Smedley Butler said after 33 years in the Marine Corps, that he had come to understand that he had been nothing more than a gangster for capitalism, making Mexico safe for American oil interests, and making Haiti and Cuba safe for banks, and pacifying the Dominican Republic for sugar companies. War, he said, is a racket in which newly dominated countries are exploited by the financial elites and Wall Street, while citizens foot the bill and sacrifice their young men and women on the battlefield for corporate greed. When Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel was criticized by his friends for walking on the Sabbath with Martin Luther King and Selma, he said, I pray with my feet. And he quoted Samuel Johnson's words, the opposite of good is not evil. The opposite of good is indifference. And Rosa Parks, who defied the segregated bus system and said, the only tired I was, was tired of giving in. And Martin Luther King, who said, on some positions, cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? And there comes a time when a true follower of Jesus must take a stand that's neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but he must take a stand that is right. Like these recent prophetic voices, we will need to speak up to bring an end to the political and corporate forces that will lead, I believe, to the utter devastation of the planet, which, uh, we have, which has already left uh, working men and women uh, and the poor in this country bereft of any kind of sustainable income, of hope, and dignity. So the battle being waged today is not about workers' rights or minimum wage or outsourced jobs. We're engaged in a battle, as you know, over the future of the nation. Ever since the Supreme Court set forth that idolatrous law that says corporations are people concerned. We are people concerned. And we're only in the early part of a fight which will either rebuild democracy or have it go down in history as a money-driven oligarchy owned by the likes of the Koch brothers and the CEOs of the Fortune 500. Thank you all.